We are going to talk about a powerful experiment that's used often. It's called gravimetric analysis. Gravimetric analysis is we're using the mass or the loss of mass, so change of mass. Either we're going to collect something and take that final mass or uh, we've evaporated something, we've lost a gas, um, and then we take a final mass. And from that, we can use our knowledge of chemistry. Sometimes it's stoichiometry, sometimes um, it's molar mass conversions, empirical, um, empirical formula uh, problems that we can find our final answer. So to give you a really good example of gravimetric analysis, we're going to do a hydrate lab. Uh, okay, a hydrate. A hydrate is going to be a compound that has a really complex bond. Um, it's called a ligand, the coordination compounds. Um, you don't have to know about those. You would be like a junior in college if you're majoring in chemistry to learn about those. This is what you need to know about hydrate compounds. You have a salt and it is bonded to a certain number of water molecules. I tell my students, pretend like it's a cage. Here's the salt and it traps water. Here's the cool thing. If you heat it up, it's almost as if the cage opens and the water evaporates out. Is that really what happens? No, not at all. Um, but for what you need to know, it works. All you need to know is that you have this salt bonded with water and when you heat it, the water will evaporate. It will be removed. So what we're going to do is begin with an amount of a hydrate. Now, this right here is a hydrate. That dot is indicating that a certain number of water molecules are attached to it. So this is called a hydrate. When you heat it, the water is evaporated off and what's left over is the salt. The salt that remains by itself is called an anhydrous substance. An anhydrous substance. Um, so we have this uh, nickel two chloride and there are some water molecules that are attached to it to make this hydrate, but we don't know how many and we want to find out how many there are. Let me show you how you would set this up. You're going to get a ring stand with a ring clamp. So here we have it. There's the ring stand and the ring clamp and you can see that these have had a lot of love. <laughs> these have had a lot of use. Um, now some teachers will have you do a test tube clamp with a test tube. I like to use the clay triangle with crucibles. Crucibles are kind of pricey though. I think that's why people don't use them and they're fragile. They're made of porcelain. They break easily. So you are going to get your unknown substance. In this case, it would be the nickel two chloride something hydrate. Um, some professors and teachers will have you weigh the crucible by itself, um, then put the mass of um, whatever your substance is inside of it and then weigh that again. So you can subtract it and know the exact mass that's inside of here. Um, for my students, I am fine for them to put their substance in and weigh it so you get one mass. We're looking for a change of water, of how much water is evaporated. Um, so you'll just want to read in your procedure, how does your professor exactly or your teacher um, want you to do the mass? Do you do the substance by itself? Do you do the substance in here, the um, crucible by itself? You can, um, it'll be easy. You can look at the procedure. Okay, so for my students, I'm going to tell them we need about two to three grams. So they're going to tear the scale, put this on the scale, um, put in there two to three grams. <clears throat> now, on your, um, your ring stand here, you're going to have a Bunsen burner. And you want the apex of the inner blue flame to hit the bottom of your crucible. So in essence, to meet the bottom of this ring stand. Um, so when you very, very, very first turn on your Bunsen burner, quickly adjust your ring stand to move it up and down so that inner blue flame, the very top of it, is going to touch, in essence, be the same level as that ring stand. The other thing I want to tell you about, if you're using a clay triangle, these are movable. They're wire, you can move them. So I always have my students, before they begin, make sure, before they've done anything, make sure that their crucible is sitting on here. Now, a word about the cleanliness of the crucible. Uh, wash this and dry it if you have time. For my classes, we have 90 minute classes. When I was teaching at the University of Utah, we had four hours. Um, if you have time, you will want to cook this to clean it. 
Um, so at the university, I would have my students wash and dry this, and then I would have them cook it for at least 15 minutes and then let it completely cool. They were cooking it to drive off all impurities. Uh, if you don't have time in your class though, and so I would ask your teacher, do we have to cook this to clean it? If you don't have time, like in my high school we don't, um, then I just have the kids wash it and dry it, and then they will add the substance to it. Okay, so you're going to add your substance here. Um, set it on your clay triangle, let me show you. And of course, um, if I had this lit, I would be using my crucible tongs. And be careful, it is difficult maneuvering the crucible. crucible. And here's your lid. Also be careful with your lid, um, putting that on top of the crucible. Now you're going to cook it. Uh, typically, you're going to cook it for 15 minutes. As soon as it's done, let me show you here, you'll take the lid off. So I'm removing the lid and I have my students put their lids on a wire gauze, um, a hot pad, something like that. And then I have them remove the crucible and set that on there too. Now this is, the crucible will actually be sitting on top of the counter. They won't be holding um, the wire gauze and the crucible. They just set it down on, on the counter to let it cool for 10 minutes. Now it's really important that you let this cool. And here's the reason why. Before you weigh it, if it's still hot, um, it's radiating heat. It's going to um, create these convection currents that will lift the scale and the scale won't read accurately. So I have my students cook for 15 minutes and then they cool it for 10 minutes and then they take the mass. Now let me show you what I have right here. My initial mass of my uh, nickel hydrate was 0.235 grams. I cooked it for 10 minutes. I let it cool, excuse me, for 15 minutes. I let it cool for 10 minutes. And when I weighed it, it now weighed 0.129 grams. So you're thinking, wow, that's a big difference in mass. What is it? Why did the mass go down? It's because we lost the water. The water is being driven off. Now we want to cook this to what's called a constant mass. So you cook it again. After you've gotten this mass, you do the whole thing over again. So I'm taking you know, my complete apparatus, pretend that this is sitting on a counter, on a lab counter. Um, this crucible has cooled for 10 minutes. Put it back on here. I'm going to put my lid back on. We cook it for 15 minutes. Okay, ding, 15 minutes is done. And now we take the lid off. I'm putting it on my wire gauze to let it cool. I'm taking off the crucible. I let that cool for another 10 minutes. And then I take my second reading. So my second mass is 0.128 grams. Now, if you have a difference of 0.05 grams, it means that you haven't driven off all of your water and you need to cook it a third time. You've got to heat it a third time. If you're within 0.05, you've reached a constant mass, you're good to go. So I can use this. All the water's been driven off. I know here's my evidence that I have a constant mass, that water's gone. I can use that in my calculation. So notice you're really only collecting three or four data points. The first one is the initial mass with the hydrate and then two masses, the first and second heating of the anhydrous substance, that salt. If you need to do a third, you can do a third heating. Okay, now how do you do the calculation? Remember this is really, really similar to empirical formula because these are molar ratios. One mole of nickel to chloride will um, bond with, this coordination compound, bond with so many moles of water. We need the mass of the salt, the mass of the water, we can bring that to moles and that's our molar ratio. So look at the math that I've done here. Here is the initial mass of the hydrate, 0.235. The mass of my anhydrous substance, that salt, is 0.128. If you subtract that, that's the amount of water that was driven off. So now I can take those two numbers. Here's the mass of the salt, the mass of the water. Remember ionic compounds, we call those salts. So 0.128 grams, bring that to moles. That's the molar mass of nickel to chloride. 0.017 grams of water, bring that to moles. The molar mass is 18.02. And here we get the moles. Now that is a ratio, but it's ugly. The numbers um, with those decimals, it's difficult for us to interpret. So here's our trick to get a whole number. You just divide by the smallest mole. Here the nickel to chloride is the smallest mole. 
the 9.88 times 10 to the minus 4, divide both of these, and you end up with 1 nickel 2 chloride and 6 water molecules. So we have an answer that goes right here. That nickel 2 chloride is going to bond with 6 water molecules. And to say this, it's nickel 2 chloride hexahydrate. That would be the name of that compound. All right, it's fun doing labs. This is a hurry up and wait lab. So you wanna get it cooking as soon as possible. And then you can do homework while you're cooking and cooling, cooking and cooling. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks.